the offensive side. But being being a former defensive player, I I love watching attacking defenses. Most of my uh, most of my years in the NFL were with Buddy Ryan and, and the Philadelphia Eagles, and he was just an attacking defense. And that's that's how defensive players love to play. Just get after it. They love stunting up front. Does UCF? They love the twist. They love attacking. They love playing downhill. They love the obviously every you know you could list off the stats of tackle for losses and what they did and what they've done, but that's where they like to play the game. So I am always. Always loved it. I love it. It reminds me, I remember when the, the greatest show on turf, when the Rams were, were winning all the time. And I remember talking to Kurt Warner because they would have turnovers, you know, because they, they were just a high passing, high volume offense. They would have turnovers. He said, we didn't care about the turnovers because we knew we'd outscore it. We knew we would make up for it with touchdown after touchdown. So we knew we'd give up some, some turnovers, but we knew it'd be okay. You know, that's kind of the, the UCF defense is they know because they attack so much, they may give up some big plays. You may hit them a couple of times. Listen, there were some busted coverages there where the Georgia Tech running backs were running free on routes out, out of the backfield, you know, uh, last week. So they know as a defense they're going to give some plays up, but they, they're so confident in their attacking that they're going to make enough big plays that they'll, you know, you'll, it, we're doing this so often, we know occasionally we're going to let one go that's okay. We're going to make enough big plays to make up for it. And I love watching the defense like that. You mentioned East Carolina. They haven't played a game yet this year and, and all the breaks they had to take in the offseason. What are you expecting out of them coming up against this UCF team this week? Well, it was interesting because last week we had Louisiana Tech against Southern Miss. Southern Miss had played a game. They lost it. And Louisiana Tech hadn't. They had some, some postponements and hadn't played. And I mean, Skip Hall, and they were a team at one point that's when Hurricane Laura hit near them and all their, they lost all their power. They had like one positive test. And then, and when they lost power, all the players had to go stay with their families or with each other. And there was no social distancing. And all of a sudden they had like 38 positive tests. So they had to postpone their game. Skip Holt said, I have no idea what to expect out of my team because we haven't had enough time to really prepare. Well, they end up winning that game in the last second over uh, seconds over something this on a touchdown pass that went to review. So he wasn't sure what they were going to get. I'm sure ECU, they, they can they can feel like they're as ready as they can be given the circumstances. But I guarantee you their coaches are, are when they're amongst themselves are saying, we're not really sure what we're going to get. You know, we, we had a We had a start. We had a stop. We had a start. We had a stop. We had a game postponed. You don't know. It, it's one of those. I'm sure the players for East Carolina are going to come out, I mean, just on fire just because they have so much pent up aggression and energy because they haven't been able to play, but a, can you sustain it? And B, can you make sure you don't make enough mistakes against the UCF team that knows how to on both sides of the ball capitalize on your mistakes? So I, it's, it's one of those things where you're just really not sure what you're going to get out of a team that hasn't practiced on a regular schedule and doesn't have any games under their belt. Mike, a lot of people maybe don't remember this, but you started your ESPN career. You, you called a lot of college football games, so this is yes. kind of a return back to uh, to the so quote unquote booth. I know you're not in a, in a booth per se right now, but uh, how, how have you enjoyed the transition back to uh, to calling games week after week? The the biggest difference for me is when I called games, I was doing a radio show five days a week, three days a week. I was doing what is now NFL live was called NFL tonight back then. It was me, Mark Malone, Sean Salisbury, and Merrill Hodge. We started what is NFL live. We started it. It was called NFL tonight. So I would do five, five mornings of radio three nights a week. I would do NFL live. And then I would fly out on Friday to do a game on Saturday or Sunday and come home on on Sunday and start or Friday or Saturday, come home Sunday and start the whole process over again. So there was a lot of jobs and to have to prepare for each of them. Now I'm, I'm just doing this. I'm not doing any studio shows. I'm not doing any more radio. So I'm just, all I do all week is golf and prepare for a game. <laughs> I mean, so I'm not going to lie. It's pretty nice. I mean, I'm a film, I'm a film junkie. So I watch a ton of tape. I think it's the best way to get to know players, but in the beginning it's been hard because like last week when I had Louisiana tech, well, there was no this year film to watch. I had to watch last year's film, and a lot of those guys aren't there anymore. For ECU, no games this year, so I had to watch last year. Same thing. Only you know some of the guys are back this year. 
So, but I watch as much as I can. I read as much as I can, study as much as I can, talk to players and coaches and do the game. But it's, it, I'm like, wow. So this is what it's like to just be an analyst and that's it, you know, for, for a game. This is great. I, I really dig it. I've, I've always loved calling games, but I get to put so much more time into it now. Yeah. I tell you what I heard. Uh, I heard your call um, on the, uh, uh, Louisiana Iowa State game, and it was good to have you in the in the booth. It sounded like a, you're listening to an old friend talk, which was which was awesome. But take us behind the scenes a little bit, though. I know you're not in the actual at the game site. I know yeah. you won't be at the game site this Saturday as well. What kind of challenges does that present for you as a broadcaster calling a game remotely? Your partner, I think Dave Pash, is not going to be in the room with you as well. So, what kind of challenges does that present for you calling in from like a cold Bristol studio? So it, it's it's hard enough not doing it at the game site. But then when you're separate, like tonight, um, you know, starting starting shortly is UAB in South Florida. Mm-hmm. My son Mike is calling that game with Matt Berry. Now Mike is here in, in Bristol because he does the radio show, and Matt Berry Matt Berry does Sports Center and other things here in Bristol. So they're in a studio together in Connecticut here. So at least they're together. You know, you could have, you know, look at each other and have the, the, the spatial awareness and all that, and, and at least look at each other for signals and stuff like that, but you're still doing it off a monitor. For me, it's been, I'm in, in, in Connecticut, Dave Pash is in Arizona and whoever our sideline person is, and is Paul Carcaterra this week, he is actually at the game site. So he'll be uh, at the game site while I'm, and so we're in three different spots. So it can be tough and calling a game off a monitor. I love the whole thing. I love watching what's going on on the sideline, seeing any kind of interaction there. I, I love watching things away from the ball of what's going on. But now I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of limited to only what the cameras are showing. Now, the good thing is I have a, a lot of monitors in the studio I'm at where I can see a lot of the different angles. But it's usually something I see all at once and I don't have to look at a bunch of monitors. So while it does have its drawbacks, you know, and then we try and make sure none of us are, are as you guys would know, if you're not in the same spot, try not to step on one another. So we, we try not to do that. But we got some good reps in last week and got a feel for each other. So I think it'll go even better this week. But uh, listen, it's what we have to do. So you just deal with it. I don't want to sit there and complain about it and say, oh, God, you know, woe was us. No, I still get to call a college football game, so I'm happy about it. But it definitely does have its limitations. Well, Mike, listen, you've uh, you've been really gracious with your time. We appreciate it so much. But before we end any interview on our show, we, we do a, a kind of a quick five questions. So it could be music, movies, sports, just kind of random questions. So we've got uh, – well, we do five plus one because we're not really good at math around here. So uh, <laughs> so the top five is actually six questions. But uh, are you prepared to, to face these uh, hard-hitting questions? Oh, my God. How nervous should I be? Not very because this is an easy one, I think, <laughs> off the top. Again, I, I listened to you on the radio for probably like 17 years straight. And uh, if, if you did that, and I saw you on TV a ton. Everyone knows your love for donuts, Mike. So give me your go-to donut. Mike Golick is going to go out and get himself a nice cup of joe and a donut. You can order only one donut, Mike. What are you going to order? Well, I'll stay away from, like, the specialty shops that have the crazy ones and go with more of a normal donut. It would be a chocolate icing cream filled. And I don't mean Bavarian cream. I don't like the custard stuff. I mean, like, the butter cream or the, oh. the whipped cream, like that kind of cream. Nice. So – Chocolate icing, whipped cream donut with my cup of joe, and I'm good. Nice. I remember watching your brother Bob star on Saved by the Bell the college years. Yeah. And I know you <laughs> you did some acting yourself, too. You, did, you were an episode of uh, Guiding Light, an episode of The Tilt. Is that something you'd like to get back in now that you're just playing golf and calling one game a week? you want to get back so, into acting? So here's what I want to do, and I've said this, and i said it to, like, Howie Long used to, would used to be in um, – in these action movies. Uh, I talked to, to Dwayne Johnson, the rock uh, about this as well. And some of the other guys in the action movies, here's what I want to do. I, I don't want to be an actor. I don't want to go do this or that. I want to be killed in a movie <laughs> or a TV show. You know, maybe I, I'd like to, I'd like to be an extra on like Yellowstone, one of the great hot TV shows out and have rip, you know, kill me in it. You know, that's what I want to do either in a movie. I want to get like, and I mean killed, I mean like blown up something horrible <laughs> where I'm a bad guy and maybe I get a punch or two in and then I get obliterated. That's my goal for TV or the, the big screen is to get killed in action. <laughs> All right, Mike, I got to take advantage of this opportunity to ask you a question. Um, it's a sports question. It's a football question. I apologize. 
what the hell were the Falcons doing on Sunday? Why, can, you, can you give me any reasonable uh, explanation as to why nobody in the Falcons would go anywhere near that onside kick? So the onside kick, the, the front line of the receiving team of the onside kick, their job is to, on a normal onside kick, is to take on the, the kicking team that is coming down to get the ball. That front line is supposed to block all those guys, so the second line usually gets the ball, uh, and they're the ones that, that will catch the ball. In this case, and I was finally happy to see a, a decent onside kick, even though it was very different, because I'm always amazed. Kickers practice kickoffs and field goals in a two-and-a-half-hour practice, and they all stink at onside kicks. It blows my mind. <laughs> what, what else are you doing? Practice a friggin' onside kick. Well, this was a wild one. As you said, it was just spinning. And I equated it to, in baseball, that first baseman or third baseman, you know when that, when that, when that either the bunt or that real slow ground ball gets hit, and it's just rolling on the line. And that first or third baseman is just waiting to see if it's going to roll foul or do they need to pick it up and when it's fair? Because they know if they wait, it's good. the guy's going to be safe, so they're hoping it'll roll foul. So I guarantee you, these, these guys aren't done. They knew what they were supposed to do. And anybody that says, well, they didn't know they could touch the ball before 10 yards, that's not true. They know. They didn't think it was going to go 10 yards. So, but, so they didn't want to step in front of the 10 yards and touch the ball. Then it's a live ball. Now, one of them still could have jumped on it, but as a spinning ball – Probably none of them wanted to take the chance of doing that and not recovering it. Now it's a live ball. If that thing just keeps spinning and goes to the sideline at eight yards, <clears throat> it's a dead ball. Falcons get the ball. The issue they had and something that I'm sure will be worked on everywhere now is if you're going to do that, they're probably going to say either if you have the chance, jump on the ball. If not, you got to knock the cowboy guys out of the way or you got to block or you got to almost like like box them out like in basketball. So if it does get to 10 yards, you got to be the one to jump on it. That was just one, a fluke. You rarely see that. Those guys knew what to do. It was just such an out-of-the-ordinary onside kick. All right, I got another food question for you. When okay. you're watching a football game, what's the best food to watch, to, to watch the game with? you get a big sandwich or do you get some chicken wings or what do you like? Normally, because I'm sitting in, in my chair, I don't want anything that's too messy because I would usually like wings or nachos or something like that. But I also don't want to get it messy on me. So I would probably go with a, a cleaner version of some type of snack like um, like sliders, mm. something like that. Something still small, but, but very sna- sliders and chips, things like that. Nothing that's too messy. Uh, I don't mind messy at the table. Well, I'm watching like the the red zone channel or watching a bunch of college games. I'm in my, my lounge chair and I don't really want to be messy there. Well, Mike, now that we're long lost friends, um, what are the odds that uh, we can get you to drop our names on the broadcast on Saturday? What are the odds we can get a quick shout out to Adam and Mike or after a play, you can go, Hey, you know, Adam and Mike told me about Otis Anderson. What what are the chances of that happening? Probably slim to none. Ah, I figured. Okay. All right. We'll we'll try next time. Listen, I'm just being I'm just being honest. But by God, somehow, some way, if I could do it, you never know. Right. Hey, if it's a blowout and I'm looking for film material, you never know. <laughs> okay. Well we'll be on on, on edge of our seat for a blowout. <laughs> right, I've got one more quick one. Yep. Last year, Mike Vrabel, coach of Tennessee, he said going into the season that he would cut his penis off to win the Super Bowl. How far would you go? Back to your go back to your playing days. You never got to win the Super Bowl. How far would you have gone? I, I don't expect you to say that far, but not, not, that, far. not that far. <laughs> not that far. I'm, I'm not cutting off body parts, though maybe part of a pinky like Ronnie Lott did way back in the day. Uh, but yeah, I'm staying away from some body parts of cutting it off. I would, I would do and or sacrifice a decent amount to have gotten a Super Bowl. I mean, listen, that was the goal, man. I mean, you did anything to get on the field every Sunday and, and you sacrifice, you leave parts of your body. And I guess Rabel was willing to, you know, on the field. Um, again, I don't think many people would go that far, and I and I, I highly doubt it actually would have been carried out had they won the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, but but you sacrifice a lot, you know. You and and I did it. I've talked about it many times. You, you take pain pills. You take the needle. You know, look at what happened to Terod Taylor from the Chargers. You know, took a needle for the busted rib and had his lung punctured by the needle, and it's still out now. I mean, guys, guys will do what they have to. Some sometimes maybe. I mean, I was always asked when I was doing that stuff, 
hey, uh, you know, don't you think about what is going to ha- happen to your body at 40 or 50? I said, I want to be on the field on Sunday. That's all that matters to me, and I'll do whatever I have to do to get on the field. And a lot of guys do that. So, you know, they're, they're sacrificing a lot to be out there every week. But uh, 